we are, are ready to go. So thank you. Thank you for everyone that's showing up. We're still seeing people pop in. Uh, what I like to do is I have this deep um, belief that our network is worth more than our net worth. You know, how many pockets in, in that you have in, in, how many dollars you have in your pocket um, doesn't uh, equal the amount of people that you have in your pocket. So what I'd like to do right now, like if you came into the room, go ahead in the chat right now. If you have a website, put your website, what organization you're a part of. Uh, if you got your LinkedIn, go ahead and copy in your, your LinkedIn and get that going. But I, I believe that through this session, here, here's the thing. One thing that social entrepreneurs are very good at, they're very good at utilizing their network, very good at utilizing the people. Um, it's one of the myths that we're going to talk about a little bit later about entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship. But um, just to be here and to celebrate the legacy of, of Dr. King, um, to literally have the city on my back <laughs> in, in, a, in a background and um, to see so many amazing uh, people and hopefully encourage through the session. I'm just, I'm just super, super, super excited. So go ahead and, and put it in the chat. I'll put mine into the chat as well. Um, mine is easy. It's just jimmywhiteiv.com. Check out the website and uh, I'll give you guys a quick introduction in a second. Oh, I'm loving it. I've seen it. I've seen it. I got I to gotta save this chat now. So <laughs> make sure that everyone's uh, connected. Remember, your, your, your network is greater than your network. You know, knowing the people that you can connect and have be associated with you um, is super amazing. So happy to see you guys. Happy to see you. All right, let's, let's get it in. Let's go ahead and get it started. So the very first thing that I tell young people when they have someone come up and give them a lecture, give them a presentation or give them a teacher is like, why that person? <laughs> why, why should that person be uh, talking to you and giving you advice? So you might want to ask that, like, like who is Jimmy White and why is he okay to speak about MLK and to speak about social entrepreneurship? Don't worry, I got a story that I can tell you about that. <laughs> so I, um, I go from a long family of entrepreneurs. Uh, we can go all the way back to my grandma on my mother's side. She had a thrift store, and I remember being there when I was little. Uh, my mother, she was she was a serial entrepreneur before that was even a term. She had a thrift store. She had a flower shop. She had a balloon business. My, my, she even had an arcade, and she had me selling water ice on the street. So, like, I, entrepreneurship has been in my blood uh, my entire life. My father was an electrical contractor. And I'm a small business owner and my wife as well. My wife is a clinical counselor who has a small private practice. And I have a construction company and Jimmy White speaks for my speaking engagements. So entrepreneurship runs through my blood. Um, and also Dr. King uh, has a lasting legacy for me. If you get a chance, uh, you look it up on YouTube, but um, I have a TED talk talking about one of Dr. King's most famous speeches uh, what's in your life blueprint speech. And that speech was actually given in South Philadelphia at the very school that I went to. And when I was at that school in fifth grade, no one told us about the speech. There was no plaque, there was no statue, there was nothing saying that Dr. Martin Luther King, the Dr. Martin Luther King came to South Philadelphia and talked to little brown boys and girls that looked just like me, telling me that I needed a blueprint. So I had to make a TED talk about that. And I, I see Nefertari just walked in her room um, through her TEDx studio and, uh, and made that possible. So who am I? I'm a South Philadelphia native, South Philadelphia born and raised. Um, I was an Operation Iraqi Freedom veteran. I was a nuclear Samariner on the USS Montpelier. My submarine was actually part of Shock and All. We shot 20 Tomahawk missiles in support of that back in 2003. Um, after that, I came back to the greater Philadelphia area and became a business professional professional, started out um, in maintenance, and then moved on to really try to get back into the city and do more youth and veteran advocacy. Um, I'm right now, I'm the director of engineering at Four Seasons Hotel downtown. That's how I got this beautiful view in the background. I'm in one of our premier suites right now and didn't have to pay for it. That's another thing entrepreneurs do. We figure out ways where we don't have to pay for stuff. <laughs> and um, and I'm also a George Bush presidential scholar. I see one of my brothers, Jesse here, a, a fellow George Bush presidential scholar, amazing uh, program. And um, I'm just excited to be here and to be a part of what you guys have going on. I love 
Venture Cafe. I love um, Life Science Center. And um, I just love being around amazing people. So you guys are part of that. You guys are part of this amazing network. So continue to go ahead and add that information into the chat. If you have a question or you want to chime in, go ahead and raise your hand and we'll unmute you and we'll, we'll have a conversation. But today is all about honoring the legacy of Dr. King by speaking about social impact through social entrepreneurship. The interesting thing is that a lot of people will say that Dr. Martin Luther King was one of the first social entrepreneurs. And what do they mean by that? Um, I think of uh, the, great, uh, the great poet and uh, ghetto philosopher, uh, Jay-Z, who when, uh, when he had in one of his lines, he said, I'm not a businessman, I'm a business man. And what he meant by that is no, he does not hold, at the time, he did not hold the title of CEO or business owner or yada, yada, but the things that he did created the business and the environment for things to happen. And Dr. King is very similar. Dr. King from this organic start as a minister and, and as a scholar um, to becoming our great civil rights leader, uh, not just for us in America, but also for the world to be a representative of. So today we're gonna honor that legacy. Uh, this is what I'd like you to do. Do me a favor, we won't do a poll, but in the chat, I want you to tell me, are you or are you not personally a social entrepreneur? Like, are you, are you not? Like in my approach, like just as yes or no, we don't have to do too deep into it, but uh, we'll continue on about that and talk about some of the, the myths and things associated. So let's, let's define what a social entrepreneur is to, to start out with. Does anybody got like a definition that they like to use for social entrepreneur? Like, what do you, like when I say I'm a social entrepreneur, what does that, that mean? Does anybody have, have it? Let's see. Oh, I see some people in chat. People building. Come on, Chris. I appreciate that. My TMF brother. Um, yes, I, I do agree. Social entrepreneur, entrepreneurs are definitely people. Someone who cares about values, building community. Dope. I so agree. I so agree. This is uh, the, the, uh, making money while doing good. Come on now. Now you're preaching, Dr. Terry. Uh, I, I do... <laughs> Agree, and we'll get into some of the myths that kind of dispel some leveraging capitalism for the common good. Oh, come on now. I, I am loving this chat as it is right now. Let me give you kind of the scholarly definition of it, and then we'll break it down to some of the things that I like to say of people who are social entrepreneurs. So it says social entrepreneurship is a process to recognize and resource problems into opportunities to create, sustain, social value. That's a mouthful right there. Let's start with the first part. Processes to recognize and resource to get problems into opportunities. So here's the thing. Social entrepreneurs do not need to be business owners. They do not need to be CEOs. They do not need to be the head. What they do need to be is the people that create the processes to fill in the gap. Do me a favor in the chat. I think we all have like a cause or something that we want to make an impact. That 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 social cause that we have in our heart that wakes us up in the morning and keeps us fueled. In the chat right now, do me a favor. What is your social impact that you want to make? What is the gap that you currently see in our society and you are looking to fill? And I hope at the very end of this, we can do a little exercise with that as well. Like for me, um, I see myself in the youth and veteran advocacy space. And I see this gap and this disconnect between our nation veterans and our civilian population. So I'm extremely blessed that I can navigate some of those communities and do something I like to call reach beyond the break. Whatever that break was between the two groups, I can reach beyond it and find that common ground. Um, I, I love some of these chats. Support the future of education. Come on now. Uh, making Omni shine. Come on, Stephanie. I appreciate that. Every zip code hole. I love that. Connecting veterans and civilians, creating purpose and opportunity. I, I love that as well. It's, it's the social entrepreneur recognizes the gap. You got to first recognize it. It's, it's something that I like to say at work, right? So I am a... Um, building, maintenance, engineering, and I, I have a team of technicians and engineers 
and vendors that work underneath me. And this is gonna sound a little bit funny, but it's completely true. Whenever someone from my team comes to me uh, with a problem, I do the Jacko Willock thing and I say, good, how are we gonna get it fixed? So they can come to me and say, the generator is broken, ah! And I'd be like, good, how are we gonna step up to the plate and get this resolved? Um, they can say, oh, the, the presidential suite is a complete mess and we got Will Smith coming in in five minutes. How are we gonna get this done? I said, good, now we get to use some of the techniques and skills that we learned from other times to make it possible. The social entrepreneur looks at those situations instead of saying that this is bad and complain and cry about it and put it in a Facebook post, they turn around and recognize that they can input a process to reach beyond the break, to fill in the gap. Let's take Dr. King, for example. Dr. King saw as his social initiative that there was a divide in our country, that racism was still alive and racism was dividing us as a nation. So he went out there to reach beyond that gap between racial communities to say, no, we are one. No, we need to be the better. No, we need to be equal and not divided. I'm loving some of these things. Finding artists and other creatives a way to get paid properly for their service. Come on. If I do an honest job, I want my honest pay. You know, you got to put that money in my pocket. I love it. Um, bridging uh, youth and support them and gaining access to opportunities. I love it. So here's the first part. You got to recognize that there's an issue. You got to gather the resources so that you can address it. And what happens there is you change that problem to an opportunity. I I'm probably one of the most optimistic people that you meet. When, when, uh, when I'm, wherever I'm in a meeting or something like that, I always turn around and I say, hey, what is the opportunity in this situation? How can we improve? How can we take this to the next level? I'm always looking for the opportunity. When you begin to talk to people about opportunities and stop calling them problems or issues and downers, it begins to bring a up instead of a down. Does that make sense? I'm challenging you, the next meeting you are in and someone says they have a problem, say, hey, that's not a problem, that's an opportunity. They might laugh you out the room the first time, but I guarantee you after the third or fourth time, it'll start to make a difference in that meeting. So, all right, let's talk about the last part in this definition is to create sustained social value. And I think that's really important because we can even look back in the last year and we look at the social uprising that we have. The challenge that we have, not just as a nation, but also in this world, is not to address issues as a flash in the pan. In other words, it can't be about a moment it has to be about the movement. How do we sustain social change? How do we create an environment where social, um, social impact is not something that we gotta um, fight and struggle for, but it's something that we use in the process to, so that when the next issue comes around or the next COVID inequality comes around or the next pandemic hits or the next natural disaster or the next political unrest comes into play, we say, if we did it once, we can do it again. That's the, the beauty of, of a social entrepreneur that you have this mindset that I can address the issue, sustain it to completion, and even cooler, I can inspire others to take the next step to be a part of it. So I know that was a lot, but I wanna kind of go into some examples of how Dr. King and the civil rights movement decided to use processes to make social change through social entrepreneurship. If you if you still with me, give me a thumbs up. That way I, I know that you guys understand. All right, I see some thumbs up. I know you guys are getting it and it's making sense. Let's start with this first one. Dr. King and the civil rights movement at the time created infrastructure for young people to become part of the civil rights movement. Think about that. Young people, students, high school students, and college students to step up to the plate and become what they call freedom riders. This core group of um, volunteers that will go from city to city, city teaching young people about nonviolence, teaching them about um, peaceful advocacy, teaching them how to do a protest that even though you might be bodily harmed, you can do these type of techniques 
to minimize that, but to make the statement that I am here for change, not for violence. I, I can't tell you how difficult that had to be for people to make that decision to uproot from their hometowns and travel to areas, especially in the South, where they knew they were gonna be in bodily harm. But the cool part about it is the process and the infrastructure where they would have these training meetings, where they would get together and have meals. And during those meals and conversations, they would teach young people how to peace peacefully protest. Imagine if we did that during this last uprising. Imagine if we did that during the George Floyd protests. Imagine if we do it for the next thing that really hits us. We need our social entrepreneurs to build these systems and put them in place so again, goes back to that narrative, it's not a flash in the pan, it's something that's gonna be sustained. It's not the moment, but it's gonna be the movement. The next one I think about um, that I learned about recently in some of my studies is the freedom concerts. So think about this, how did Dr. King gather financial resources and funding to support these protests, to support these organizations, to support the social impact he was trying to make. Get this, Dr. King, when he came to Philadelphia, his purpose um, in 1967, when he gave his famous speech, What's in Your Life Blueprint speech, what I did my TED talk about in South Philadelphia to little kids, that was actually a detour from his main purpose of coming to Philadelphia. His main purpose of coming to Philadelphia was to promote the Freedom Concert, or I'm better, he called it the Freedom Festival. And the Freedom Festival was at the Spectrum. Who remembers the Spectrum? I got a couple of people here. I know my cousin Daryl here. We, we used to go to the Spectrum for the game. So hey, you remember the Spectrum back, back in the day, uh, the old arena, but right then it was brand new. And they had Aretha Franklin. They had Nipsey Russell. Um, they, they had uh, all these famous entertainers, uh, Harry Belafonte they would come to these cities, perform concerts and take the revenue from the attendance and the donations they received to fund the movement that they were having in society. Think about that. Think about that real quick. We, I, I, I think about this. Could you imagine if Dr. Martin Luther King had the internet? Could you imagine that? Like what would he do with the internet? If you want to talk about GoFundMes, you want to talk about um, YouTube videos. Could you imagine Dr. King having a, a YouTube channel? I mean, that thing could get a hundred million views every, every single time. Matter of fact, I want you to do me a favor in the chat right now. What would Dr. King do with, with YouTube? Like what would he do with the internet? Like what, what would he, how, how would he use his social entrepreneur mindset to kind of take the civil rights movement to the next level. And then the challenge is obviously this, right? We have that tool. We have the internet. We, we have cell phones where we can spread a message and, and have it go from Philadelphia all the way to Canada or and all the way to India and all the way to China. We have these tools. Like, could, could you imagine the influence that that could have in our society right now and the tools that we have? That's what a social entrepreneur does. They utilize the resources and tools they have to make the impact that they're trying to make in the world. Uh, and then the last one I have is this. If you get a chance, do me a favor, do some research on the Montgomery Improvement Association. The Montgomery Improvement Association. So here's something crazy. And think about this. We all know the story of Rosa Parks and her being um, locked up and how that was the major start to the Montgomery um, boy, uh, bus boycott, right? Um, here's the thing that you might not know. That was all orchestrated. So it, it wasn't by chance that Rosa Parks got arrested. She, she set up and volunteered to be a part of it. Let's, let's take it one step further. Rosa Parks at the time was very instrumental in the NAACP at that time. If I'm not mistaken, I believe she was a secretary for them. So she was part of this planning and setting up for kicking this off so that this initiative can happen. So here it is. Montgomery Improvement Association 
recognize the issue in the gap. There was inequality happened on the buses where I had to sit in the back when someone else of a different color was allowed to sit up front. That there was this inequality and imbalance. And when they saw that opportunity, come on, somebody that, that can hear me. I'm, I'm preaching a little bit. Y'all y'all say with me. That opportunity, they then built a process to set this up. Um, here's the cool thing. And what sometimes we might not learn from the history books. Um, the Montgomery bus boycott lasted for 381 days. 300 in 81 days that African-Americans that needed to get to work, they needed it for a job and for a wage to travel around the city of Montgomery. They made the conscious choice that they would not ride on buses because they recognized the opportunity wasn't just in the, um, the political statement, it was in revenue and loss of funds. And once the city began to lose funds, is when they begin to realize they need to make a change and make an impact, and there was a court case associated with it. Uh, I want to I want to read something to you guys that Dr. King wrote um, at the beginning of that protest. And actually, I'm gonna try to share my screen with you guys so you guys can see it as well. But Dr. King actually, uh, one of his most uh, his first major speeches was about um, was at the very first day of the Montgomery um, uh, bus boycott. Um, here's the other thing, think about this. That boycott kind of created the first car share <laughs> that was in the city. It, it was literally, they set up Uber way back when to make sure that people got to work. They created this integrate process that people that need to get to work, they, they brought in cars from out of state. They brought in drivers. They, they created sign-up sheets. They built this whole entire process to fill in that gap so that the protest could be more meaningful. Uh, matter of fact, Dr. King said that when they first started the protest, they thought only 50% of the people that rode the buses would do it. And then <laughs> the very first day, can you imagine this? the very first day they found eight African-American people riding the bus out of the thousands that were riding in the past? Can you imagine being one of those eight? <laughs> Can you imagine going home to your community? Like, hey, you rode the bus today? Really? You was it? That was you? That was you riding the bus? Good job. <laughs> he said, he said, after a week, 99 and nine tenths of the people that rode bus, um, African-Americans that rode bus stopped doing it. So let me let me read this to you guys real quick. It reads, and we stand and sit here this evening as we prepare ourselves for what lies ahead. Let us go out with a grim and bold determination that we are going to stick together. We are going to work together. Right here in Montgomery, when the history books are written in the future, somebody will have to say, there lived a race of people, a black people, feisty locks, in black complexion, a people who had the moral courage to stand up for their rights and thereby they injected a new meaning into the veins of history of civilization. And we're gonna do it. God grant that we will do it before it is too late. As we proceed with our program, let us think of these things. And then this last uh, paragraph I wanna read for you guys. So I'm urging you now, we have the facilities for you to get to your jobs. And we are putting, we have the cabs there at your service. Automobiles will be at your service. And don't be afraid to use up any of the gas. <laughs> if you have it, if you are fortunate enough to have a little money, use it for a good cause. Now my automobile is gonna be in it. It has been in it. And I'm not concerned about how much gas I'm going to use. I want to see this thing work. And we will not be content until oppression is wiped out of Montgomery and really out of America. We won't be content until that is done. We are merely insisting on the dignity and worth of every human personality. And I don't stand here. I'm not arguing for any selfish person. I've never been on a bus in Montgomery. 
but I would be less than a Christian if I stand back and said, because I don't ride the bus, I don't have to ride a bus, that it doesn't concern me. I will not be content. I can hear a voice saying, if you do it until the least of these, my brother, you do it on to me. I don't know about you, but uh, that right there brings me chills uh, every time uh, that I read it and every time I think about it. So that explains kind of Dr. King, his social entrepreneurship aspects of his movement and some of the things that he did that allowed the civil rights movement to really move into the next direction. So it was really social entrepreneurship at the Montgomery bus boycott that kicked off Dr. King's civil rights movement and civil rights career. I think that's, uh, that's pretty dope. Uh, I wanna talk to you now about some of the myths of, entrepre uh, of, of social entrepreneurship. So the very first one is this, and I saw someone put it into the chat earlier, that all social entrepreneurship is only for nonprofits. Social entrepreneurship is only for nonprofits. I'll let you know that is completely and utterly false. It's not just for uh, government agencies. It's not just for the VSOs and the 503s. Um, social entrepreneurship should and must cross many social economic enterprises. It's gotta be a core value in every organization, no matter how it's structured or how it's built. Uh, it, it goes back to that statement I, I said before that, uh, you know, Jay-Z said, uh, I'm not a businessman, I'm a businessman. And, and what that means by that is the things that I do is I use these skills, I use these traits, I use this ability to influence others. I, I, I see this vision and I go out there and do it, but I bring the resources to sustain it and make sure it has the impact that I want. One of the things that uh, organizations that I do a lot of work for is the Travis Mannion Foundation. And I'll never forget the training they gave me. The, is, Travis Mannion Foundation is a veteran service organization that empowers veterans, gold star family members, like my sister that I see in the chat, a sister Monica, um, and inspires civilians to build character and leadership in the future leaders of our nation. Uh, there you go, Jesse, if not me, then who, brother? Um, and, and here's the, the crazy part. I'm, I'm doing the veteran mentorship where they're kind of explaining to us the mission of the foundation and how they were going to empower me as a veteran to help build my community. And they told me this. They said, Jimmy, if you have a cause, if you have a youth group, if you have a community center that needs to be cleaned up or painted or you just had this idea that you wanted to do Zoom presentations all across the United States. Uh, we will support you 100%. And we won't just support you by saying that we support you. We will give you the funds. We will give you the technology. And we will connect you with other veterans and Gold Star families across the US to make that happen. And the very first thing I said is, yo, they want me to be a social entrepreneur. They want me to identify the problem figure out a process to resolve the problem, and then they're going to give me the resources to sustain the impact that I'm trying to make in my community. Can you imagine that? Like a, a, a VSO, a, a, a veteran service organization, I thought all veteran organizations did was, you know, get together, do some 5Ks, drink a whole lot of beer, and tell, you know, tell war stories. Like that's all that I, I, I knew about veteran organizations. But when I found the Travis Mannion Foundation, it flipped that completely on its head, where I can go out and make an impact in my immediate community and also nationally, and they gave me the resources to do it. So here it is, a nonprofit that I was associated with allowed me to use social entrepreneurship to make a difference in our nation, young people. And I'm so indebted and grateful for that. So uh, uh, give, give me an example of, um, of a for-profit company that is doing social impact and using social entrepreneurship. If you do me a favor, go ahead and put it in chat. I wanna, I wanna uh, start uh, highlighting some of those and we need to celebrate those. We need to celebrate that. Jesse, definitely the NFL is doing a major uh, initiative for that. They are empowering the athletes to identify the charities and the communities they wanna support. 
Um, they're doing amazing things. I totally agree with that, Jesse. That's definitely, definitely one of them that are out there. Um, all right, let's go into another myth uh, while we're doing that. Under Armour, yep, a, a big TMS supporter, definitely one of them. Uh, Tom and Bonham's on the uh, retail side. Nice, I totally agree. That's awesome. All right, all right so um, here's another myth. Another myth is that um, it's, only for, um, it's only for a short period. Whatever impact, Whole Foods, dope. It's only for a short period. Like it's that flash in the pan that I was talking about before. It's, it's just to address that immediate issue. Uh, I, I disagree. I think social entrepreneurship must be sustained. Uh, here's the deal. If you call yourself an entrepreneur and you start a business and, um, and you quit after the first you know, three months, uh, I'm sorry, but I, I wouldn't call you an entrepreneur. <laughs> but because you know, a lot of times you deal with adversity, you deal with things that 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 come up. It can be be tough. But you know, an entrepreneur, uh, they got to be resourceful. Um, they have to deal with adversity. Um, they have to be a connector and a problem solver. So imagine uh, connecting that entrepreneurship role into social activism. How? Even when I have an obstacle that comes in front of me, I can figure out a way to get over it and get to the next level so that that impact really happens. So social entrepreneurship needs to be sustained. It needs to be carried on. It, it can't be a, a flash in a pan. It has to be built into your core. And actually, this is a really good time to give a shout out to, to my good friend that here is that's in the chat, um, my friend Saeed. Saeed, can you, um, can you unmute for me real quick, brother? Yes, I can. Oh, Saeed, yes. uh, thank you so much yes. for being here today. So um, me and Saeed are, are very good friends. Uh, Saeed is an entrepreneur. He has his own um, apparel company and coaching company. Um, in addition to that, me and Saeed, Saeed connected, believe it or not, through the Travis Main Foundation, um, supporting uh, the youth and juvenile that he worked with at the Juvenile Justice Center um, in Philadelphia. So Saeed, I appreciate you, brother. And I'm, I'm so glad to have you here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. So, um, so something really cool happened uh, this week, and I want to share this with, with everybody. Um, Saeed had a chance to uh, watch my TED Talk. Uh, so, <laughs> so Saeed, why don't, you, uh, why don't you tell the people uh, what you told me after you, uh, after you watched the TED Talk? So, yeah, after watching your TED Talk, it just um, it inspired me and, and, um, and lit fire in me. I was working on a project um, with my company. Um, last year, I had a, a collection of apparel that, that it, I call it Go Together. And it's love, go, um, love and God go together, love and justice go together, and love equality go together. So I was making a new version of um, that, those particular, that particular collection. And I would watch the TED Talk, and it just, Martin Luther King, he stood for love, he stood for God, he stood for justice, he stood for equality, and, and I'm like, wow, that just go, that just go with, right along with what I've already been creating, and so um, I, I, I immediately called Jimmy, I said, Jimmy, I have an idea, it's something I really want to do that's truly dear to my heart, I want to start a scholarship fund, and so any, any, uh, any time someone buys those shirts that I have on that promotion, that a percentage of the proceeds will go to a scholarship fund to benefit our youth here in Philadelphia. So hey, let me um, let me show the promo. I'll show the promo now. Okay. Can you guys uh, see it? Let's see. There it goes. Yeah, we I want to suggest some of the things that should be in your life's blueprint. Number one in your life's blueprint should be a deep belief in your own dignity, your own worth, and your own somebodyness. Don't allow anybody to make you feel that you are nobody. Always feel that you count. Always feel that you have worth. And always feel that your life has ultimate significance. Secondly, in your life's blueprint, you must have as a basic principle, the determination to achieve excellence in your various fields of endeavor. 
You're going to be deciding as the days and the years unfold what you will do in life, what your life's work will be. Once you discover what it will be, set out to do it and to do it well. Be a bush if you can't be a tree. If you can't be a highway, just be a trail. If you can't be the sun, be a star. For it isn't by size that you win or you fail. Be the best of whatever you are. Yo, that is that is major. Oh, thank you, thank you. I, I'm so so proud of you. And um, honestly, I think it's um, when you when you shared this with me. Oh, by the way, the shirts are available now. They are out. I got my first one right here. Uh, do I have it upside down? I think I got it upside down. Number one, uh, entrepreneurs out there, make sure you got some good packaging. He got he's got the sticker right here. He's got some treatment stuff on how to do it. So I'm a, I'm a I'm gonna do an unboxing right here for you, Saeed. So you can be <laughs> awesome. the first one to uh to rock the shirt. But uh here it is right here. Uh, love uh love equals equality. So Saeed, uh, amazing. Uh, I think it's a perfect, perfect example of uh, social entrepreneurship where um, one, the scholarship is going to make a difference in a, a, a young person's life. And two, this is something that you can do um, and sustain annually and continue to grow and can continue to build on. So I'm, I'm just so proud of you. Give a hand for Saeed for what, for, 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 Thank you. That social Thank entrepreneurship. You. That is so, so dope, brother. I, I so Thank appreciate you. Good deal. So go to his website, go to his Instagram, check it out. Uh, Saeed, go ahead and put it in chat again. That way everybody can see it and we can all um, support your, your social entrepreneurship, good sir. Will do. I appreciate it. Awesome. And, and you know what? I, I think of a, a saying that a mentor to say, tell me, we don't all have it made till we all get in paid. <laughs> and 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 what it said, what it means to me is with social entrepreneurship, when we see the gaps, when we see the gaps, we all we all jump in and we try to fill the gap. And you find if someone, hey, if if it, if it's a plumber down the street, hey, you make sure that plumber is employed, and so that plumber could continue to pour back into the community. Um, traditionally, growing up, you know, you had uh, the corner stores in the neighborhood. They gave into, uh, they, they poured into the youth and, and gave to the youth right. leagues and things like that. So they felt empowered and they felt that they was able to stay out of trouble and be exposed to different uh, opportunities. And so they can be successful in their life. So that's what it's all about. You know, we all having some type of influence on uh, the future that is before us. So uh, thank you, Jimmy. I appreciate it. Yeah, bro. I, I so agree. All the work Actually, you're doing. Yeah, I thank you for the encouragement, bro. I so so appreciate you. I'm so glad I can uh, uplift you and amplify what you're doing, brother. Keep keep on doing. So uh, it actually this transitions really well to a video I want to show you guys um, about Dr. King. Um, I'll give you a, a little bit of a background here. Um, social entrepreneurs uh, step up to the plate um, when other people don't. Um, and a famous quote that's associated with Dr. King, but it's kind of taken a little bit out of context, but it's, it's, it, it fits for what we're going to talk about right now is this idea of, are you a thermostat or are you a thermometer? Are you a thermostat or are you a thermometer? Um, Dr. King actually wrote a little bit about this concept in his letter from the Birmingham jail. And when he was writing about it, he was talking about the church and the church's influence on the civil rights movement. But we as a society has kind of morphed it to mean you, you and your impact into society and this concept of indifference. So uh, let me play you this video real quick of Dr. King. And then we're going to have a little bit of talk about our impact and uh, where we're trying to um, B, are you trying to be a thermometer or are you trying to be, are you trying to be a thermostat? We must honestly admit certain things and get rid of certain myths that have constantly been disseminated all over our nation. One is the myth of time. It is a notion that only time can solve the problem of racial injustice. 
They are those who often sincerely say to the Negro and his allies in the white community, why don't you slow up? Stop pushing things so fast. Only time can solve the problem. And if you will just be nice and patient and continue to pray, in a hundred or two hundred years, the problem will work itself out. Well, that is an answer to that myth. And it is a time is neutral. It can be used either constructively or destructively. I'm sorry to say this morning that I'm absolutely convinced that the forces of ill will in our nation, the extreme rightists of our nation, the people on the wrong side, have used time much more effectively than the forces of goodwill. And it may well be that we will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the vitriolic words, and the violent actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence and indifference of the good people who sit around and say, wait on time. Somewhere we must come to see that human progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts and the persistent work of dedicated individuals who are willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the primitive forces of social stagnation. So we must help time and realize that the time is always right to do right. The time is always right to do right. Dr. King in, in that speech was talking about those who show indifference. Oh, sorry, hold on. YouTube does it again. <laughs> um, he was speaking about a group in our society that kind of stand on the sidelines. Um, those that see the problem, um, but aren't addressing the problem. This idea that uh, I, I know that something needs to be done, but why should I do it? Why should I take the risks? Why should I be vulnerable? It's not happening to me. It goes back to what Dr. King said on the bus. Um, even though I don't ride and never have written, written a Montgomery bus is part of my struggle. It, it's part of me. It, it's part of what I gotta do. So, so here's here's the here's the tough pill to swallow, right? Um, I said this earlier. Each one of us has this. I'll make it even personal. Myself personally, um, around 2017, 18. I began to feel a huge gap, like something was missing in my life. And if you go by professional means, everything was the way it was supposed to be. I, I, had, I had reached a high level professionally. Um, I was making, um, my wife will tell you not enough money, but I was making good money. <laughs> My wife's on the Zoom, so I can't say too much. <laughs> Love you, baby. Um, I was um, I was leading, a, and I was actually leading a global team at the time. I, I was I was doing pretty well. Um, we had a nice house, nice car, all, all the things that you're supposed to have as a as a young professional. And I remember waking up and just feeling like something was missing. I I wasn't doing everything I was supposed to do. And, um, and in 2000 and 2005, the year before um, I left the military, um, my mother came to a celebration with me. I, I had just won junior cell of the year. Um, I, was, uh, I got some accolades. Uh, my wife, who was my fiance at the time, was there. We celebrated. We had a ball. Um, at the very end of the, the, the trip, my mother comes to me. And she said, Jimmy, you have one year of military service left. Uh, what are you going to do? 
And I turned to her, I said, mama, I don't, I don't know. And she said, baby, come home and do the work. I'm pretty sure that was the words. It's a long time ago, but I remember those like, like, like she was sitting in a room with me today, like come home to Philadelphia and do the work. And when that moment, when I, you know, 11 years later, when I had this ache in my heart, I realized that I did come home, but I wasn't doing the work that my mother told me to do. I wasn't honoring that call to action that she put in my heart. And um, unfortunately, uh, about a month after she told me that, she passed away. Um, so I quit my job, that high paying global job. Um, I found a job closer to the city uh, making less money and an hour commute. <laughs> but uh, I, I had this aching in me that I wanted to do more at home for my community. And I wanted to honor that legacy that my mother um, had given to me. Um, and I can tell you since then, and my wife hopefully can uh, uh, attribute this, um, I've been better, I've been happier. I feel like I'm making an impact in my city, in, in my hometown. Um, I, I quite literally feel like I got the city of Philadelphia on my back, um, not just in the background, but like right on my back, and that I get to um, honor what she gave to me. So it, it's, it's this idea that I can no longer be indifferent um, because if I'm not part of the solution, I'm part of the problem. Just as much as that person that is um, neglecting our young people, just as much as that person that is promoting racism, just as much as that person that is um, denying um, equity, um, I am just as comparable. I'm just, I'm just as guilty. Um, so what's that hole in your chest? What's that hole that you're holding on to? Um, are you the thermostat or are you the thermometer? So what does a therm thermometer does? A thermometer reads the temperature of a room. Um, it doesn't do anything else but read it. Uh, but the thermostat, on the other hand, just like a thermostat that you have at home on your furnace or your HVAC unit or your air conditioner, the thermostat reads the temperature and then it does something to change it. So are you a thermometer or are you a thermostat? Are you reading the room that you're in and taking no action? Or are you reading the room and being part of the action? Are you bringing the change? Are you lighting the fire? Are you cooling off the fans of hatred, uh, uh, the flames of hatred? Are you being part of the solution? And this is the beauty in being the thermostat is that the thermostat changes. It'll do what's necessary in that moment, in that time to satisfy the need. And even cooler, it doesn't do it for itself. It does it for the people who are affected by it in the room. So my challenge to you is this, be the thermostat, be the difference maker, be the change. Dr. Martin Luther King walked into rooms and he read the rooms and he gave the rooms what they needed so that they can go out and make social impact. Dr. King would travel from city to city and state to state and spread this message of love, beauty, and justice, no matter the color of your skin, no matter if you're male or female, no matter um, what religion you are, that you have worth, that you were value, and that you were somebody. He compelled and inspired so many. And that's what social entrepreneurs do. They see others, they empower them, and they help them to the cause that they're looking for. So I challenge you, adopt the title of social entrepreneur. Keep the legacy of Dr. King alive. Entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, they're change makers. They're troublemakers, that good trouble. They go out there and they make a difference. They're problem solvers. You are the greatest problem solvers that our nation has. And uh, I, I'll take it one step further. If you're, if you're like, like me and you're a veteran, who, who better to, to tackle problems than those that all we knew how to do 
was to go out there and fix stuff and take care of stuff. Come on, we are the change makers that we need in this world. So I challenge you right now, be the change that we want to see. We got a couple minutes left. I know I talk a whole lot. I'm a minister too, so that kind of stuff ha happens from time to time. But I would love to open up the discussion uh, specifically around one, networking. I want everyone to, to network with each other. But two, what do you see as the gaps that social entrepreneurship can get around? Oh, I love that. Thank you, Jesse. It was one of the things that I wrote down and I totally forgot to say. That's why you're my brother. Social entrepreneurs are disruptors. Disrupt the system, change the system. Be the one that comes in and says, uh-uh, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. There's a whole story about Jesus being a disruptor and him knocking over tables. I won't get into that right now. Maybe I'll preach that on a, on a sermon one day if you guys want to catch, catch that. <laughs> Monica's like, yeah, I want to hear that one. Um, <laughs> it, it goes, Jesus is a gangster, but that's a different thing all, all, all in itself. Uh, but yeah, I want to hear what, what kind of things, um, I'm actually not in, the, uh, I'm not in the chat. Let me bring up the chat. What kind of things are you guys um, seeing the gap that social entrepreneurship can um, can can reach beyond that gap, and you can actually go on mute if you want to go on mute. You can we can talk about it. Uh, we got about nine nine minutes. Oh wait, uh, your dad had a sermon the same. Oh, I love it. All right, I, I gotta hear it. Did he say that Jesus was a gangster though? I don't know. That's my that's like my line. Jesus is a gangster. But I don't think he said Jesus was a gangster, but I did. But he did specifically tell me um, that. Um, about the turning of the tables and stuff. And he said, sometimes you got to have a little disruption in your life. Ooh. And sometimes you've got to go and disrupt and make people a little uncomfortable because that's what makes them notice what's going on. But yeah, it was a long sermon that day. <laughs> Ooh, I, love, I love that. That that was dope. Awesome. All right. I see um, Martin. Martin, go on mute, brother. Where you at, Martin? Are you there? Can you unmute? Or maybe not. Sorry about that. You know, oh, there you go. What's up, brother? How you doing, man? Hey, How's the man. baby? She's doing good. She's doing good. We think we uh got some stabilization because we got off of Gerber and got on an Infamil, and she seems less gassy. And I think that she was allergic to Gerber, so you know, this is everything. Every, one you know, one thing is another thing is another thing. But thank God that um we were able to have her in Philadelphia and at Chop. Chop has been such a blessing to our family that's, that's uh, children's, awesome, so, children's hospital of philly so i don't yeah. know if anybody know doesn't know chop but it's children's <laughs> hospital of philadelphia bro that's, that's awesome all right talk a little bit about uh the initiative you were talking about oh yeah i was just saying that i i don't see i think one of the things social entrepreneurship needs is, is funding i was trying to find this article on my um, phone while you were talking that's what i was doing uh there's a new fund that did, just just popped up as um coming out of philanthropy, uh, the Inquirer had it two days ago. It's a $100 million fund for um, black and brown businesses, but it's called GRIT. And what I liked about the concept is they're, they're using um, community development, um, financial institutions, CDFIs. Uh, and that's the first time I've seen a city like Philadelphia look at the CDFIs as a way to make sure that businesses can get the funding they need. But this particular fund and this particular concept is really, to me, looking at social entrepreneurship in a different light. We, in Philadelphia, we hear a lot about STEM or science. We yes, very we rarely hear about money coming down the pipeline for folks that are, uh, one example is someone who has, a, they, they got their garbage truck just for their um, community in North Philly to clean up their community. So they bought a garbage truck. And so they're creating a business around you know, the picking up the trash there in the community because they feel like the trash is not being picked up enough. Um, they need money. They need I money. love that, dude. Here's, here's the interesting thing about that story is that someone had to take the risk of buying that truck um, before the other things came right. together for, you right. know, that fund to be picked up, you know? So like social entrepreneurs, you have to be a risk taker. Like you got to take that calculated risk. Um, it's, it's interesting, and I'll just say this briefly, is that as, a, as someone that's looking to make an impact, I don't think we, one of the myths is that you have to sacrifice everything. Like you have to live and die for your cause. Um, I don't think that's necessarily the case. Uh, I, I think you need to live for your cause. You know what I mean? 
So this, this idea that you have to sacrifice everything and sacrifice all your funding and all your savings and you got to go borrow from Billy Joe Bob and the, uh, the local loan shark to get your you know, initiative off the ground, I think is a falsehood. And, and Martin, for stuff like these funds to be out there, it just shows that these things are available. Uh, they're out here. You just have to find them and, and be resourceful. Well, I had an interview with the uh, Kansas City Federal Reserve Bank uh, two days ago. They have a new book coming out that's free um, talking about the history of Black banks. And one of the things they, they talked about that I thought was interesting was that um, to get banking done, you really have to have a bunch of different issues um, like the, the uh, deposits and loan ratio. But, but we could theoretically set up, which is what this article is talking about, it's philanthropy, people contributing to a, to a donated fund, then that money is gonna to go to already established financial institutions to supplement their deposits and allow them to make the loans. So it's like us funding ourselves. And I think in Philadelphia, what I've observed is not a non-Philly Philadelphian who wasn't raised here, is Philly has a lot of leg and a lot of um, interest in this fellow man, like you say, it's, you know, Philly, love city, your brotherly love and sisterly affection. It's really like that here. I just don't think that we have um, harnessed that, that concern we have for our neighbor in a funding scenario. And this will maybe, this will be the first time that we actually see, you know, an actual um, vehicle, a financial vehicle based on the Philly spirit. That's, that's pretty dope. And, and here, let's do a, a quick plug. You, you, we also got Venture Cafe here that um, can help you connect to those resources. You guys are now part of the ecosystem because we got your email address. So, so we're going to be definitely inviting you guys to some more stuff and do those type of connections like Martin, um, Martin was talking about where we can connect entrepreneurs and connect people to the funds and the resources that they need to go to the next level. So I think that's pretty dope. Um, does anybody have anything else before we wrap up? I, I, I hate to, uh, to cut anybody off, but um, I, I still got that hour commute because I, I, I do have an hour commute. <laughs> it wasn't just a good story. It, it is a good story, but it was just was. All right, awesome. So uh, again, everyone do me a favor, make sure that you're connecting with the people that uh, are in the chat. Um, if you have any initiatives or projects or things that are going out there, um, literally, like I said before, our, our network is worth more than our net worth. And, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm better off and you're better off when we have like-minded people come together for social impact and for social change. So thank you guys so much. I'm Jimmy White. You can check out the website. You can check out the TEDx. You can uh, come to the Four Seasons if you want to. We got some good carrot cake pie. Uh, Monica can tell you that. <laughs> tell you that. Uh, and I so, so appreciate you. Thank you guys so much. Have a blessed night.